saludos nuevamente, bienvenidas, bienvenidos y bienvenidas todos a esta segunda edición de la jornada de arte, investigación y creación multidisciplinaria del Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico en colaboración con Hunter College y el Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueños. Es para mí un placer recibirles y darles la bienvenida. Mi nombre es Raquel Torres Arzola, soy curadora pedagógica del Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico y les presento a Ángel Antonio Ruiz Lavoy, director de Arte y Cultura de Hunter College. Así que adelante Ángel quien va a estar presentando el panel de ahora de la una de la tarde. Disfrútenlo. Muchas gracias, Raquel. Uh, welcome to everyone. My name is Angel Antonio Ruiz. I'm the director of the Arts and Culture Department uh, at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Uh, this is the second part of our journey today. Uh, this panel, it's named Creating from, Creating from Zero. Um, and this panel will explore African-American and Afro-Caribbean diasporic religious practices and their centrality in the construction of New Rican artists anti-colonial aesthetics. The panel will be framed by New Rican Spoils Cafe and the New Rican Arts Mo Movement founder, Miguel Algarín, uh, 1981 essay, New Rican Literature, where Algarín defines Point Zero as a source of Puerto Rican's literature vibrancy. With us today, we have Luis Elaine Griffith. Uh, she's a writer, artist, living in Brooklyn, New York. She's one of the founders of the New Rican Poets Cafe and has been a professor of English at Borough of Manhattan Community College at CUNY. We also have Valerie Matos. Uh, she holds a master in literature, language and criticism from CUNY Hunter College. Uh, they are the program director of Inwood Community Services and adjunct professor at Boricua College where they teach American literature through multiple perspective. We also have Joseph Cáceres. Uh, Joseph is a queer Puerto Rican writer from the South Bronx. His work has been published in Slice magazine, Cosmonautus Avenue, Cura and Emerge 2019, and alumnus on the Yale Writers Workshop. Joseph, Joseph is also the recipient of the Bronx Council of the Arts, Bronx recognizes its, its own uh, Brio grant for fiction and Lambda Literary Writers Residency for Emerging LGBTQ Voices. He has a PhD, or he is a PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center uh, and the English program where he studies queer American artists and African and Caribbean descent. Uh, no, with, with no further, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass it on to Luis and we'll, we'll begin the, the panel. Uh, they're gonna speak like for probably 30 to 45 minutes. And after that, if you have any question, please uh, um, put your questions on the Q&A so we can address them later. Uh, thank you all for being here. Luis, please. If religion is a faith you live in, then how do you speak on dimensions of your home? Ungayo Boracho told me, to speak of another without knowing you speak of yourself is Estupidez, when you're looking to speak about what you don't know how to speak. So I say, archipelago children, come out of the black hole. Cross over the event horizon. Ven me, call out the dark desconocido. Barasuayo. Omo mia la guana mama, Kenya irawoe and begin creating community with La Mesa to hold the spirits. My grandmothers, my mother, Obia women all, never sounding speak about the power, but using it with intention. I am small when I see my mother's altar catch a fire on its own and she gives me words of caution about my being willful. I meet Algarin, a man who's man enough to be the woman he's made to man, man enough to be with a woman whose girl man is a woman that needs to flower, man enough to live in place where he's not born, to build a home from empty space for us to entertain 
all those who don't belong in homes that are their homes where they are homeless and speak a language they've learned that doesn't speak the speak of what they don't know how to speak. Barasuwayo. To manifest a stage in place and time, la confluencia is point zero of community. So we opened the door to the storefront used to be Sunshine Bar on East 6th Street. We have old t-shirts, wife beater kind, to wet and dust. We sweep, we mop with pine soap. We sprinkle Agua Florida everywhere. We sprinkle Agua Florida on our hands. We strike a match. The fire is blue and pink in our hands. We shake them out in the air. We clap our hands. The fire burns itself out. A dust of smoke remains, holds the sound of hands clapping, hides from our hearing as it travels, travels, travels into a poem Pedro Pietri writes, blue was never really blue. Pink was never really pink. Somebody was fooling you. To get drunk, you have to drink. Algarin's mother, Doña Maria Socorro, comes with Agra Florida and oraciones. She walks around the space, sprinkles the water, whispers her prayers. She is an essential part of this limpieza. We open our doors to the street. People wander in, sit at the bar and on wooden chairs at the tables facing the stage. Miguel Lobo Loperena, our MC, sets out the notebook at the end of the bar. It's the book we use for poets to sign up and read. Anyone can walk through the door from the street to the stage. Anyone can sign up to give voice to self in front of our community. If Jorge Brandon is present, Lobo escorts the old man to the stage, and if he is in touch with the sorrows he carries, he regales us with his masterwork, La Masacre de Ponce, opening a chapter of Puerto Rican history, of Caribbean history. We must not forget the brutality of the colonial domination that has brought us to this moment with Brandon, old and homeless, and still shell shot from the 1937 Palm Sunday massacre of the peaceful celebrating 64 years of the abolition of slavery, protesting the imprisonment of Albizu Campos on charges of sedition for preaching the island be a nation. Brandon in post-trauma all the time wearing a construction helmet he's painted black with red and white lettering proclaiming he is el coco que habla in this moment under the veil of history we sound our voices habla viejo to bind together all who are present in community edgar rivera comes through the door with his guitar and song Que bonita bandera. Then the neighborhood musicals come, Congueros, Richie Cruz, Eddie Conde, Stephanie Chapman, Pedro Morejon. Sometimes words come with the drum music. Tato Labiera is gifted inventing call and response incantations that evoke the Afro fire in our blood. We let go the words and the drummers make bombas, the rumbas for our dancing. The courtly men take out their handkerchiefs to wave and snatch at the women's skirts. All the rhythm language, who will go away with whom to break the night for another beginning? We come through the new Eurekan door with what we have. Amiri Baraka comes out of Spirit House in Newark to do theater. What has the Lone Ranger to do with the means of production. A small, mousy white man plays the Lone Ranger. Come to find out, Lone Ranger was a real person, born a slave. 
New Eurekan Poets Cafe doors opens image memory for me to come with intention for Caribbean speak at root. I reveal my Lena Lime with Miguel spelling her with an I, sometimes calling me out loud by her name. The thing about names, they hold things for attention to put the spit on the point. Attention to zero point whose beginning ends to begin the beginning of the ending that ends to begin. Archipelago children come forward now. Association of Caribbean States, Association de Estados de Caribe, Association des Etats de la Caribe. Ben, already mise en place, donde esta? Through this door, I understand to get drunk, you have to drink, to be both doer doing what you do, who does a freestyle buscando el nombre for doing what you do. And both of us, Algarini, Jo, no money professors, teaching to maintain, teaching what we don't know we have to teach and holding to intention for changing la musica of grammar as we create what we give over for study at home. I stand with this man, Algarin, in the house we work lifetime to build. On the title page of his book, Body Be Calling from the 21st Century, he writes to say, how can I serve the call of the collective wild? Perhaps by denuding it, perhaps by cutting the knot that ties London to New York. Is this a dig? I get it. On the fly leaf of his book, Times Now, Jaya's Tiempo, Maga Sono Toki Desu, he tells me, to you, my Lois, more words now in Japanese. Wow! The speak must use words to sound lo que no se puede decir. Words like Attention, cuidado, I must watch out how I use them lest they tangle me in knots. My mother has cautioned me about Obia's powers without ever saying to use them with care, but I understand intention in life, in theater, intention can fill an empty space. We use Yoruba words to summon the Orisha Elegua in the home I build with the man who is man enough to be the woman he's made to man. We chant to remember the Orisha who owns all doors, holds all keys, stands at the crosswords from which we move from point zero in directions that he opens to us. We use the chant Broken words come from the throat, a sobrevivir, so that I remember that part of living holds what I know that I don't know what I know. Archipelago children, come out the black hole, cross over the event horizon, then you call Barasuayo. Another door opens. We Latin hustle dance to that old Hector Lavo tune. Todo tiene su final, nada dura para siempre, until we break night. Algarin is dying. When I look in his eyes, I see the dying, el profundo. Even with the cataracts, I know he can see that I see. The gaze between us recalls his poem, Conversation number five with Christ. Yo veo, tu ves. Y cuando yo veo lo que tu ves, el espacio entre tu y yo desaparece. Pero todavía desespero. ¿Por qué? 
no sé si tú hiciste lo que yo hice para lograr ver lo que tú ves. So I speak to the dead. A rhetorical exercise in vision to approach point zero. I see Algarin five days before the COVID shutdown in New York City, 2020. The last time alive in the broken people warehouse uptown Manhattan where Spanish Harlem meets Fifth Avenue Central Park. Que tristeza. Rehabilitation Center is a euphemism for permanent sadness. El desesperación managed by the church of whose good intentions now paid by the state to manage those who won't be managed. The nursing home is nursing Algarin to death. I find him strapped to a wheelchair with a buzzer monitor. He attempts to rise from the chair. Then the sensor attached to the seat emits a loud piercing sound so attendants will appear to strap him down again to keep him in place. How do you become a misleading appearance? Some people die before they die. The door has opened before I see it has opened. I leave him. I look down the hall to see him. The elevator doors close. Alegua closes doors to open doors. Cuando la caliente tocas, it burns you to lose its burn. Pero no todo está perdido. Dígame, what is the spice you find when you enter the word? Y cuánto hot breath do you suffer? And what fires you along el camino real para llegar at point zero, presentando your being fresh, unao frescao, at ending to begin, una nueva onda del sabor. If I read this to Alperin, he would play talk aesthetics. He would want to see himself and what I see, then shift and say, let's go have a drink. He would lead the way to a favorite watering hole. Bartender would set up vodka shot and bud chaser for getting on the present tense of the afternoon buzz. Barasuayo. Punto. And I use that punto now to recall another ancestor, Beery Thomas, who used to get up in the cafe to recite. And at the end of every thought, he would say, punto, as if we didn't know, as if we didn't get the zero, the point to start. Gracias. Thank you so much, Dallas. I'm always in such awe of you. That was a poetic archive we got to experience. Um, so, hi, um, my paper is Basilic Poetics, Reverend Pedro Pietri and the Black Pentecostal Poetic um, Aesthetic. Um, this paper utilizes Ashan Crowley's text, Black Pentecostal Breath, the Aesthetics of Possibility as a foundational lens um, for reading two obscure and abstract poems by Afro-Nerican poet Pedro Pietri. For those who are not familiar, um, Pentecostalism is an evangelical religion where worthy believers receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the language of tongues, or the technical term glossodeia. It is also important to note that Pentecostalism is a culture of sensation. All that is felt and embodied during praise is proof of and is the materiality of God. 
So I'll just play like 10, 15 seconds. Um, it's a long that's what it can sound like. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what happened to the slideshow. Oh, there we go. Um, so that's something, that's how it can sound. They very, of course, there's nothing that um, um, sounds the same. Um, so yeah, so this is considered the materiality of God. But Ashan Crawley emphasizes that the body and breath practices of the Black Pentecostal aesthetic, which consists of whooping, tearing, shouting, and speaking in tongues differ because Blackness is a critical description to normative theological thought and practice. Something shifts when the practitioner exists um, in a body who George Heigl wrongly determines comes from nothing, have nothing, and therefore are nothing. Um, but Crawley counters Heigl by utilizing Martin Heidegger's ex existentialist theories of nothingness to develop the notion that glossolalia and glossographesis um, speak not words, but the very stuff, the materiality from which words come. Glossolalia speaks the experience of nothingness compels an analysis of what such nothingness is and could be. Black glossolalia offers a generative capacity to create from zero. Most glossolalic practices are free vocalizations using speech sounds and sequences that are not identifiable, identifiable by any existing languages. Glossographesis, which is the written version of glossolalia, is considered spirit writing. I will utilize this practice as a mode of studying the Reverend's work. There isn't much time or language to fully describe him. Um, but according to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, uh, the poet Reverend Pedro Pietri is dubbed the Sun Ra of Puerto Rican letters. With the reverence for Christianity, he was legally ordained and inaugurated his church, La Iglesia de la Madre de los Tomates, and preached to those he called the poetry to pride. His work consists largely of plays, poetry, and film writing that speak to the New York experience. He led safe sex advocacy, as you've seen by the cross in the first picture with the condoms nailed into it, and for many years worked alongside the Young Lords Party. Pietri performed an embodied and alternative theology, an intentional absurdity that solidifies his closeness to the Black Pentecostal aesthetic. The first poem is entitled Watering the Plants. The poem is made up of mostly numbers and symbols you'd find on a typewriter or calculator. I was and still am mostly left with questions. Um, if we but if we utilize the, the title for some guidance into Pietri's intentions, could it perhaps be as simple as an abstract visual piece that displays the diversity of plant life in a garden or home? Could it be a bit more complicated? Perhaps a statement on capitalist consumption and destruction of nature given the symbols are largely fiscally related, or maybe a combination. After having read a large portion of his literary corpus, could it be in addition to his commentary on how poor folks are unable to properly mourn because they are mostly consumed by the financial burden of burying their dead? While frustrated and embarrassed by the need to figure it out, I remembered when Crawley explained that Glossolalia is irreducibly incoherent and gener generative for a Pentecostal radical imagination. Not the recovery of nonsense, but the refusal of sense having the final say. And that glossographesis are markings for an emancipatory, liberatory project. This is the point and purpose. Pietri's poem resists all possibilities of meaning making in traditional capacity. My embodied frustration and embarrassment speak to a shift, a change in process to consider how knowledge is produced and transformed. The next poem, The Broken English Dream, is um, split into six sections and written entirely in punctuation marks by also drawing some meaning and thematic possibilities from the title and practicing a close reading of the pattern and traditional functions of each punctuation mark, I began to reveal a narrative. Although it seems contradictory to the nonsensical nature of glossolalia and glossographesis, this poem still 
carries glossographic qualities. For example, Piedri using symbols that cannot be literally read unless they are provided with their lingu linguistic uh, labels. Also, the technical use and function of punctuation symbols are meant to offer instruction and tone of the text, but they are not set in relation to any meaningful letters or words, leaving us to read into the spirit of the narrative, a kind of divinatory poetics that Crowley would call the speechifying of nothingness. I argue that the way Pietri structured this piece and his use of punctuation marks expresses the challenging experiences of someone who for the sake of survival is in the process of an informal second language acquisition. It is possible that this poem speaks to what Pietri witnessed as Puerto Ricans, uh, witness of Puerto Ricans forced to endure the violence um, of a forced migration to New York City or other parts of the United States. So here we see that the Reverend begins with the period. As we know in the basic rules of English grammar, the period is meant to bring ideas, statements, and entire projects to, full, to a full stop. It signals a strict pause with an intention to end or begin anew. But what happens when there are no words for the period to end? What if there are no statements between each hard stop, each beginning? We are left with harsh and tonal noise. We are abandoned in a loud silence and a nothingness. A non-English speaker who is violently displaced and forced to sustain all of the socioeconomic brutality that came with the New York, New York experience is familiar with the soundscape presented in this section. Pietri evokes feelings of stagnation, fear, and shock at different lengths, made literal by the uneven pattern of the enjambment of each line. What is also curious is the shift in the Spanish translation on the right of the English version of the piece. There is still a pattern. Periods are translated to exclamation marks in seemingly random places of each line. These ex this expresses two possibilities for me. The first is that there is a tone in the Spanish language that will always be missed and when being translated to, from, to and from English. The second is that Pietri is trying to remind the reader of an embodied jolt of fear, confusion, and trauma that the voice of the poem can express in an English version. With the, with the assistance of Alfredo Matilla, um, Pietri makes visible what cannot be heard. So he then continues um, with commas. Commas, we know, are used as brief pauses. They are not as final and concluding as periods, but they provide space, a moment for breath, a break, a possibility for con con creating connection. Commas can also be used to set off quotations, offer a moment to house and replicate the words of an other. This is, with his use of the comma, Pietri represents the initial chipping away, the breaking away, the breaking open of a new language, perhaps the possibility of sound recognition and or a modest familiarization with signs and symbols. Pietri reminds us that the very nature of nothingness is the state of impermanence, just as Crowley describes the Black Pentecostal aesthetic. Black Pentecostalism shares in the negation of desired stasis and stillness, a rejection of objects impenetrable, of knowledge exhaustible, the potentiality for further discover, discovery expired. And then we see here there's a combination of commas and periods. Um, Pietri reminds us of the oscillating nature of displacement when it pertains to both language acquisition and a general state of being nothing. This movement reminds the reader of what it feels like to have moments of clarity, to, um, to have moments of clarity, but then be confronted with restriction. But if those, but what if those commas were instead apostrophes and the conversation instead shifted to the ownership of silence? And so semicolons here are not as rigid as periods, but their presence in the sentence speaks substantially, more substantially than the comma. The semicolon connects related but independent clauses and links ideas, analogous ideas. The semicolon, um, um, sorry, when thinking of the functions of the semicolon symbolically and in terms of the broken English dream, two things come to mind. The first is this is Pietri's cue that in this process of language acquisition, there is a presence of two separate languages. In this case, English, Spanglish, um, and in Spanish. Um, and the second is the possibility of um, the beginning of a merging of two cultures, which will eventually manifest into the New York experience. 
Pietri combines semicolons and question marks. In section five of this poem, this pattern's length and spacing of each stanza vary. Question marks function as tools for interrogation and are also used in place of unknown data or nothing. Pietri brings us into this section of the poem to interrogate the relationship between both languages and cultures and how they function for some surviving displacement. Though the primary language on the island is Spanish, we must remember that both languages are vestiges of multiple colonial legacies. Because of this, the colonized body is always in a liminal space, a state of flux between several worlds and nowhere at all. Pietri's practice again grounds us in Crowley's Black Pentecostal aesthetic because as Crowley explains, Basalelia not only enacts a disruption of grammar and lingual form, but enacts spatio-temporal incoherence, producing a floating nowhere. And then lastly, um, in the final section, it ends with only question marks. And it is clear that it is appropriately leaving the reader in a place of nothing, of unknowing, of zero. Um, it is simply, it, it is a simple implication of a precarious future, but also of the acquisition of what Lois once called a New Yorican speak. Um, I must re reiterate that Pedro Pietri offered an entire narrative entire individual and collective experiences without words and incomplete and utter nothingness. By omitting text, Pietri offers a new mode of documentation, an expansive form of archiving that resists representation and offers opportunities to feel through, listen differently, and for some of us to embody this remembering. This is the gift of glossolalia as a mode of study. This is the divine generativity of the Black Pentecost. Thank you for that. And thank you also, Lois. I'm always in awe of you. And I'm actually very grateful to be in community with both of you. Um, so I guess I'll just get right into my paper, which is very much in, inspired by uh, over a year long discussions with uh, Lois um, and other artists and scholars about the centrality of Santeria and Palo Mayombe and the aesthetic practices of the cafe and in the lives of the artists involved in the New Yorican arts movement. Living in one of the most powerful Christian empires in the world that is hostile to non-Christian people, an empire that uses religion to oppress and colonize racial and ethnic minorities and push them to the edges of the empire, I find the deployment of Yoruba traditions and the work of New Yorican artists transgressive because it reflects the audacity of many of our African ancestors who use such traditions similarly in the face of death for survival. And the evocations of the ancestors, the Orishas, the importance of religious paraphernalia like El Indio being visible in the cafe, incantations, drumming, dancing, ceremonial rituals, community building are used through the work, the art to reimagine, reclaim, revise, remember, and re-envision those assemblages alighted by a legacy of colonial oppression and history to create new bodies, new lexicons, wholly inhabited and possessed by the past as acts of provocation of discursion. What the work of New Yorican artists does, what she or he wrestles with, is informing us what's at stake in thinking through such radical, transgressive aesthetic practices. On the one hand, it offers a site of resistance. It exposes and challenges the violence of colonial oppression. Yet on the other hand, the resistance is ongoing. And those voices and those practices and those artists and those communities and those people doing that work are still always subjected to the forces of oppression they are rallying against. And yet there is still a lision. But the hope is in the work that has always been and is always being done, especially by our artists whose oeuvres embody and are grounded in the discursive culture of our African ancestors, of our artistic forebearers. And that way, New Yorican artists produce work that is expansive, provocative, and builds communities in a way that continues within our and ugh, continues within our ancestral legacies. In a July 1st, 2021 email, Lois reflects upon this when she calls a New Yorican poet's cafe with its Afro-Caribbean roots, a contemporary remnant of the Cross River region. Through the work of Ivor Miller, an authority on West African cultural societies from the Cross River region. Lois writes that they are, quote, societies, clubs, lodges that have been transplanted through slavery and migration to the Caribbean and parts of the states. 
Miller details in his book that these cultural societies were, quote, developed as a primary institution to enable cross-cultural communication, effectively serving as a United Nations forum. Creating a shared system of symbols and values, this club became a model for managing diversity with mutual respect, end quote. It is through this lens of understanding the New Rican Poets Cafe as a site that continues within the legacy of West African traditions, as something that is part of our cultural heritage, that I approach Miguel Algarin's concept of point zero. In his 1981 essay, New Rican Literature, Algarin defines point zero as a source of Puerto Rican literature's vibrancy. Quote, when you have nothing and can expect nothing, anything you do is something, so that our experience makes it possible for us to write poems that describe our actual condition without fearing that they might be too personal or too lost in the detail of the day and not metaphysical enough. The consequence of having that context freed of standards that kept white American writers enslaved for so many years brings with it a blessing. And the blessing is that language can be worn again and it can be worn as feeling. You can feel it all over again since it is something you have just learned, end quote. To give this context, Algarin's notion of point zero is a response to the urban decay Puerto Ricans, African-Americans, and Afro-Caribbeans who migrated to New York inherited in the years following the Vietnam War. A decay that was a consequence of white flight, the construction of the interstate highway systems, a legacy of redlining prior to the passing of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, and the loss of blue collar factory jobs. Delegated to the margins of society, the edges of the empire, forced to reside within this prison of urban decay, in one of the richest cities in the world, exempt from certain sectors of the job market, unable to obtain lower or fair interest rates on home loans, alienated by languages and cultures, English and Spanish, that struggled to possess us completely, subjected to the injustices of gerrymandering and prohibited from assimilating within American society, Puerto Ricans were given and made to feel as if they were nothing by the predominating culture. Point zero then points to the material and immaterial realities of our condition. Thus, Algarin, like members of the diaspora, have historically done, turns to our African cultural heritage for means of survival. One of the ways he, as a cultural leader of the New York community, does this is by stressing the import of vernacular language. But Algarin, Spanglish as a form of bilingualism is not only an anti-colonial tool used in curbing acculturation, but is an element of the New York aesthetic rooted in orality that allows the New Yorican to be, quote, accurate about our present condition, psychic, economic, or historical, end quote. But Algarin, this is crucial because in the light of urban decay, he is seriously interested and invested in procuring New Yorican futures. Art and language are the ways for him that this can happen because the elements that define the aesthetics he is creating out of is rooted in, quote, a mixture of Catholicism and African religions, and most importantly, the way we carry on the oral tradition, the tradition of expressing self in front of the, the tribe, in front of the family, end quote. The plurality, discursive, and communal nature of the African traditions allows for this kind of propagation and intervention, especially when, as Algarin also notes in his 1976 essay, Value and Value of the Breath of Poetry, Puerto Ricans living under the colonial dominance of an American empire pay into social institutions that contribute to their oppression. One insidious example he provides, the public school system rep responsible for illiteracy in the New York community. This is where Algarin notes how the African oral tradition, the New York aesthetic is rooted in, allows two illiterate New York children, a nine-year-old Georgie Lopez and 14-year-old Hector Rodriguez to use a New York, the New York lingua to both create their poetry and plays and gain access to literacies that challenge, stimulate and cultivate the intellectual, psychological, and personal development. Alagarin states that both children dictated their poetry and plays to people who then typed their words onto paper. But Algarin says that wasn't enough. For Georgie specifically, Algarin states, quote, he had to do something else. He had to indicate to us where the line stopped. Otherwise, whoever typed would sit there and invent the lines for him. He'd just do a little rap, which would be taken down, but then he wouldn't know anything about a line and the value of a line. So we got into the habit of typing it as he said it and then demanding him, oh, sorry, demanding from him that whenever he was finished with a thought, he had to let us know, end quote. 
Here is an example of the New Yorkian aesthetic challenging this child to work and develop the literacies he does have, specifically speech. The complexities of listening, a part that is so central to understanding oral traditions, is the other point Algaring is making here. In that regard, the New Yorkian aesthetic not only offers Georgie a channel to express himself, freeing him from the fetters of the predominating language and the educational institutionals responsible for exempting him from that language and alienating him from society because of race and class. The New Yorkian aesthetic also offers both young men to record their lived experiences while gaining access to new forms of radical literacies by embodying a new discursive language that enables them to combat and address the colonial forces responsible for their oppression. This is important because Algarin's notion of point zero, specifically, but the New Yorkian Poets Cafe aesthetic in general should be included in discourses on radical, anti-colonial, anti-racist pedagogies and literacies. Most importantly, most sorry, mostly because historically, the New Yorkian aesthetic has been effective in offering support to communities in need. It is effective because it allows members of marginalized groups methods of embodied learning. That is a way to embrace, address, record, str struggle, and deal with the institutional lacks that plague their communities. Lacks the predominating culture and society is disinterested in fulfilling because they are constitutive to the formation and accumulation of the predominating culture and society's wealth because they are profitable. As I said to Lois in the countless discussions we had on this topic, reading what Miguel writes in New Yorkian literature and volume and value of breath and poetry, I conclude almost as in an epiphany that this is something that we do. If the New Yorkian Poets Cafe and the New Yorkian aesthetic did not exist to offer us this kind of relief, something or someplace else would. And coming to understand the history of Puerto Ricans in the Lower East Side and the history of our people in the Afro-Caribbean diaspora, these kinds of interventions are things that we have been and continue to do. Here, I'm thinking about the important work African-American artists and scholars have done with African-American vernacular English. As Al Gooding notes in New Yorkian literature, the mixture of languages through vernacular vulgar languages like Spanish and English, for example, and the creation of new languages is, quote, an old phenomenon. At the edges of the Latin empire, French, Portuguese, Romanian, Italian were all considered vulgar languages at the edges of the empire. And they were really just reflecting constant and daily usage so that their irregular verbs or irregular usages became dialects, which in the ultimate passage of time made the formal respected languages of today, end quote. But there is something about America and the American cultural landscape that disallows for totally embracing this kind of discursive intervention. And perhaps that is the point. So when Algarin writes that Puerto Ricans are placed at point zero with nothing to lose, since for us, there is no land or wealth at stake, only life. It is a provocation that both exposes and counters the rhetorical violence associated with the ideals responsible for our colonial oppression while simultaneously deploying the discursive nature of our African cultural traditions and the creation of emancipatory rhetorical strategies in the face of continual oppression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph and Valerie and Lois. Uh, this has been amazing. I love how connected you are all. Uh, looks like you're really having conversations about this kind of constantly. Uh, been very, very informative. Um, for the audience, if you have any question uh, for our panelists, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the, of the screen. So make your questions there, please. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, it's it's wonderful for me how you know the Puerto Ricans, um, the Puerto Rican poets and members of the Puerto Rican Poets Cafe, uh, been kind of creating an aesthetic of bro brokenness or, or brokenness, because uh, Tato La Viera also talks about broken and Pietri Pietri does the same, right? Uh, and it feels to me like very liberating. Uh, can we talk about a brokenness uh, aesthetic in the New Yorkian Sports Cafe in general? How do you mean broken? I'm sorry? How do you mean broken? 
uh, when it comes to language, you know, uh, it, it been used against them like, oh, you have a broken Spanish or a broken English, but that that broken thing, they kind of empower themselves about it and, and use it to transform and to create something new, right? I don't see it as broken. I see it as inclusive. I mean, language has to change. Mm -hmm. And it's about change and it's about the changes represent the people who are beginning to own the language. So we make a new language now mm -hmm. and we don't consider it broken. Mm -hmm. This is how we speak in our home. Yeah, Take it absolutely. or leave it. Absolutely, totally agree with you. But I love how they play with that sense and, and make it like a new thing, right? Like yes. they were like, you, you can call it broken, but we're creating something beautiful that empower, you know, all of us really. Um, I, I wanted to see, oh, there's a question here, a question for uh, Ms. Matos. It says, the word survival is so perfect for Pietri's work. I wonder if you will say more about how you read his punctuation poems in conversation with his condom poems and the safe sex, safe sex at Bocasi. You know, I haven't, I haven't put them in conversation yet and I haven't, um, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I think this is something that I'm going to go back and do, um, but I'm happy to, to answer any other question regarding the punctuation poems. Okay. I, I'd like to comment on that. I think it's, it's part of his sense of the absurd. It's, he has a, a a unique surrealist perspective that is uh, part of the Caribbean experience, not just in Puerto Rico, but in uh, Martinique with Cesaire. Um, think about Adal Maldonado, who passed recently too, wonderful artist who was a, he and Pedro were close. And I think um, the absurdity of putting condoms on a cross. I mean, sometimes Pedro would come to the cafe. Uh, he lived on 40, 43rd Street. And he'd get on the subway with this big cross, like Jesus coming down the, on a Palm Sunday with the cross, having to carry the cross. And attached to the cross were all these condoms. And remember, this was the age of AIDS. And the absurdity that somehow established religions weren't jumping on board fast enough, soon enough to make refuge for disease, those who were considered diseased is part of that surrealist consciousness, I would think. Um, okay, thank you for that question and for the answers. Uh, because of the conference is about unlearning, I wanted to ask you all, uh, what will be the importance for unlearning, especially for uh, diasporic Afro uh, Puerto Rican writers in general, even today? I guess Make I, community. Yeah, and to even add to that, um, a shift in the the locus of enunciation of just the way that we in this country are taught, a very Euro-American perspective. Um, and these artists, particularly the ones we talked about today and Lois, and I throw Lois in there as well, um, very much advocating for shifting that, the, the look, that, that perspective. Um, and, and in that shift, I think it's not only it enables to build community, but also to uh, um, chip away at the establishments and the institutions. Um, I don't, it, yeah, chip away, but also to make it more expansive as well. Because I think that's the, the major problem is that it's so narrow, so confining that there's, um, in the sense that it's narrow and confining that it 
is a through line uh, for funding <laughs> for Euro American things, but things like Puerto Rican studies or Africa, anything having to do with the African diaspora, um, those fundings and the, the, the monies that are delegated to those things are put into question, uh, as well as a scholarship. Um, and I think that's for me to take away, one of the takeaways I get from working with these artists and working with their work. Um, and also to bring uh, our communities inside the institutions so that we see ourselves represented there and being taught there as a, a vital and reflective, reflective of our culture in these institutions. Because a lot of times, I mean, when I was growing up and, and going to college and whatnot, nobody was studying Afro-American history. I was involved in, um, in 1968, the takeover at Columbia where we shut the university down. And it was only after we did that, that they started paying attention. They made, and it took them 50 years from then to create uh, African-American and uh, African diasporic studies department. And we have to understand that we need these departments created because it is through the department that the university gives funding. If it's just, oh, let's teach a class. No, 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 no. We want real inclusion. And I think students now go into universities where there are no departments of Caribbean studies or Afro-American studies or Puerto Rican studies need to demand these kinds of things. And if they don't know, somehow they need to create community and bring the community into the university. Um, I think also it's a under unlearning that uh, knowledge and non knowledge production happens solely, so like in a cerebral way, right? And to kind of shift our understanding that our bodies hold this information too. Um, and our bodies produce this information also. I mean, we're thinking about Beatriz. Um, before he wrote any of his poems down, they were memorized, they were written, and they were, you know, orally expressed. So what does it say when we shift our focus from the written text and into, you know, kind of embracing the an embodied learning and an embodied, um, uh, like, more of an embodied um, focus? So, yeah, I think it's like unlearning a lot of like, you know, the education happens in the classroom and the academy in our minds and more so like, okay, but what is like, what is the rest of us saying? Like, what is the rest of our, our, ourselves saying? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Luis, you, you make me think about actually the beginning of Centro, right? Which is a result of, of just that, right? Like, uh, the, the, the fight from students and academics to be represented and to tell their own stories, right? Were you somehow related to, you know, um, this these moment in, in history? Because I know that the Columbia, the Columbia um, uh, you know, uh, revolution was kind of linked into the, the, the creation of Centro. Like it was a sparkle that that created or motivated other things were you part yes, of that because we had we had uh, a lot of friends at uh cuny at city college uptown uh -huh. and it was through them too that year was a a worldwide movement because there were there was student revolution in paris in mexico city all over the world this was happening some people started getting a awakened and then the 70s came and things kind of said oh well you you people you people need to calm down and we calm everything down and then after cuny created the uh afro-american department it took it away it took it away <laughs> <laughs> uh, listening to you, I was also reflecting on University of Puerto Rico. Uh, 
that, that we've been having Estudios Hispanicos for so long, like since the inception of the university, but, but a department that actually addresses like African diaspora studies began like a couple of years ago. And, and that's that's pretty, pretty sad. I, I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do we have any other question from um, the audience? Yeah, we, we don't have any other questions. So, anything else you guys would like to share with our audience before we end up the call? I just want to thank Lois and, and Joseph. Like, it's one thing to do this work that's important to you, but then to do it with folks that you admire and that you respect and you love is, is really huge. So thank you. I want to thank Joseph and Valerie, Joseph has pulled me out of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> and understands my passion to make our voice inclusive in this process of education. So that, and also, and being inclusive in this process of education, we have to understand it's just not a linear way of thinking. We have to understand that particularly from Africa, you know, I've been reading a lot of Wole Soyenka recently and, and things that he's saying, I'm saying, yeah, why didn't I think of that? That's true. You know, we don't think of things necessarily as, well, this happens and then that happens, no. Things can happen. You can tell the story of history in terms of simultaneity so that we can see point zeros all over the place and they link. So Valerie and Joseph, this new generation, the fight is in your hands now the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I, I want to thank both Valerie and Lois, and especially Lois, for um, the New York and Poets Cafe and its aesthetic and everything it represents is a site. It's an actual place. But working with Lois taught me that it, it really doesn't necessarily have to be that concrete place, because Lois really does carry it with her. And it's literally home. And literally the community that I've built outside of the Graduate Center, um, also including people from the Graduate Center, um, has been a saving grace. And so Lois is like a lifesaver. <laughs> um, and I appreciate both you and Valerie and for Centro and Matt yes, and PR you. for holding this because this is really just a, a way for us to like share what we've been doing for a while. So thanks. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you all. Like this morning, we have a beautiful panel with um, artist Juan Sanchez. It was it was amazing. So we talk a little bit about art. Now we talk a little bit about uh, literature. And our next panel is going to be at 4 p.m. And it's going to be about like um, environmental sensitivity, sensitivity, visual sovereignty, and uh, the use of colonial monuments in the public space. Uh, so tune in for that one. It's going to be at 4 p.m. on the same link. So we will see you all later. And thank you, Luis. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you, Joseph. It's been amazing. You, you all have a place at Centro. Looking forward to meeting you in person soon, okay? Okay. Have a great one. Thank you very much.